Hello everyone, I'm Pastor Dylan and welcome to the Dayspring Wesleyan Church Podcast. The best way to stay connected to the life of the church is downloading our app. Simply go to the App Store, search for Church Center, and download the app and enter the information for our church. This will connect you to our church community. I pray the following presentation will inspire you to come closer to God in this journey of faith. Enjoy listening. Good morning, church. So uh, Kim uh, Tyree did our announcements this morning, and uh, so it's one of her first times. So uh, if you notice, she glitched a lot, you know, but uh, we think she'll get better at it. Uh, Austin said he has to deal with that all the time at home uh, when he talks to her and stuff. So, uh, but it's a great job she did for us. And so Kim, thanks. Uh, we want to make you aware of a couple of announcements as we get into the uh, service today. First of all, uh, we have Ash Wednesday coming up. Uh, uh, the February 14th. So guys, if you want to get out of taking your wife out for Valentine's Day, just bring her to church. Okay. And uh, it'll save you a lot of money and uh, you'll have a religious experience as well. Uh, maybe you can do the thing before or after, but we're having that at seven. Uh, we're going to have communion together. Uh, we're going to do, um, if you want ashes on your forehead or your hand, we're going to do that as well. But if you're uncomfortable with that, don't worry about it. We won't do that for you. Okay. But it's just going to be a uh, great time as we get into the Lenten season. The other thing is uh, we have several people that are going to be with us tonight for our belong class. Um, and uh, we, uh, is it belong, become, believe, believe, belong? Okay, uh, we got three of them and I get confused, okay? So anyways, uh, it's, it leads up to membership and so we have 20 of you signed up tonight and I know the Super Bowl is tonight as well. We'll try to get you out in time, uh, but who cares? I don't care about either team, so, you know, my team's not in it, so what do I care? Uh, <laughs> And then, um, uh, so we got a lot of things happening that revolve around missions today. And so I just want to make you aware of that in your, um, in your bulletins that you were given. And there's a lot of information about Bible studies when you get involved in the church. But in that is a little card today. And we, we told you about it last week. And um, I just want you to know what that card is about. We are, are basically trying to raise money for missions and prayer support as well. And I'm gonna give you a list of that later of what missions and groups that we support. Um, But what we're asking is this, if you're able to give above and beyond like your regular giving and you're able to give it specifically for missions, all this will either go to local or global missions, all that we're taking. So uh, a faith promise is basically this, as God provides, you will give, okay? If you're not able to because of financial hardship, don't worry about it. All right, you're not entitled to that. But if you're able to give, we would love to give to have you give uh, and be a part of that. We have about fifty thousand dollars we're trying to raise just for missions itself to some of the things, and we'll let you know about those things. But these are going directly to missionaries and to local mission stuff here as well. So I want you to know that um, we have one of the things that we're doing. We brought Pastor Wayne on to do this. He runs an organization called One Plus God, which supports about sixty missionaries. As a result of our partnership with him and him coming and teaching and doing some other things for us as well, we're able to get into some short-term mission trips as well. So we talked about the Jamaica trip that a lot of our young adults or students are taking, but we also have a trip to Nicaragua, which we can take 11, and it's kind of first come, first serve on that. If you're interested in that, aren't quite sure what's to be expected or what you're doing, Pastor Wayne is here today. Immediately after the service, he'll be in the fireside room. So that's a great time to go ask him some questions about what that looks like, and he'll be able to help you with that. And then, of course, because his skill is missions, and then he's a great person who knows the Word of God. And he is going to be doing a study for us in uh, Corinthians. And with doing that, we thought, so you could get a little bit of a sneak peek of what that's going to be like. I said, why don't we kind of do a tag team on a message today? Why don't you take a little bit of time to explain to us some of your favorite parts about Corinthians? And so he's going to come and do that at this time. So would you welcome Pastor Wayne with us as well? Good morning, friends. Um, I'm so excited uh, to be with you today, and um, if you have your Bible with you, you're welcome to open it up there in 1 Corinthians, and um, I'm going to share a couple of thoughts from that uh, with us. Um, You know, uh, people often ask me, perhaps I ask you the same question, um, what is your favorite Bible verse? Um, Another way to put that in our staff devotions here at Dayspring, one of the people one, one week said, if you would end up on some island, and you can only take one page of God's Word with you, what, what would that page be for you? Well, for me, it's always been only one verse, 
one page, and it's 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9, and so you're welcome to open up your Bibles at 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9, and, and my new international version says this, God who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. So let me unpack that for a second so that you can understand that's why that's my favorite Bible verse. It starts off with God who has called you. Now, for me, being some kid who grew up on a coal mine in Africa, to think that God would be so intentional as to call me to do something with him, the creator of the universe, just blows my mind. So I'm sold just right there. It's like, wow. To be called intentionally to do what? Um, to have fellowship. And that fellowship is a very weak translation simply because in our day and time, fellowship can kind of mean hang out a little bit, you know, and see you from time to time. But the Greek word is actually koinonia, which means partnership, which just takes the whole thing to a whole different level. God wants to call me, some dude from Africa, to partner up you know, to be in this intense, long-term thing, like a, like a marriage, with who? With his son, Jesus Christ. I'm like, okay, well, God, thank you so much for thinking of some, you know, kid from Africa on a mine to be in this partnership with you, but to be in partnership with your son, not going to work out at all. Why? Because I know myself. I know I fall into temptation from time to time. I know I stumble. I know I'm sometimes unfaithful to God. This will work, perhaps, while we're in church. <laughs> On the way out of here, I might get upset if somebody that pulls in in front of me, and the whole thing will be ruined. And then it ends with God who's calling you into partnership with His Son, Jesus Christ, is faithful. I'm like, wow. This could actually work. He wants to pull me into a partnership with him, and he's the faithful one who will start this, who will maintain it and see it through. Like, I'm in. I'm all in. Just give me that page, and I'll go to whatever island you want me to go to, as long as it's warmer than here. <laughs> and so this, I'm like, what, what is this partnership about? And then, of course, God says, it's about you partnering up with my son to go and get this message out to everybody here in Marion, but also to the ends of the earth. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, God, do you remember where you've called me from? Coal mine, Africa, white African-American, how weird is that? There's no way that I can help you to get this message out here, there, and everywhere all at the same time. And God says, that's the whole idea. I want it to be such a mind-blowing task that you need to realize you cannot do this by yourself. No matter who you partner up with, even if you partner up with the fantastic people of Dayspring Church, you won't be able to get it done. You need to partner up with me and this incredible Dayspring family. And then we're going to change Marion and the world. And I'm like, whoa, that is so exciting. Give me some examples. And God says, I'm giving you 1 Corinthians to give you some examples. Because you see, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9 is incredibly special. In the Greek literature, we call it a nexus verse, which is a fancy word to say. It's like the hinges of a door. You walk into 1 Corinthians. Let's say 1 Corinthians was like a, like a house, okay? So just to help you out a little bit, imagine you go, you know, I invite you to coffee at my house, and you walk into my house. What's the first thing that you see? You see a dead animal on the wall. You see some deer hides laying right there in front of you. You see wooden carved giraffes, and you go like, oh my goodness, I just walked into Africa. And some of you sit here, and you go like, mental note to myself. Pastor Wayne ever invites me over to coffee? Let me say, no, I'm not walking into some weirdo's home with dead animals and dead skin everywhere. It's, you know, but, but you, 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 when you walk into our house, what you would assume is that if the entrance looks like this, the other rooms is probably going to be a little bit about what? About Africa. 
And so verses 1 to 8 in 1 Corinthians says, this book is about partnership. The door says it's about partnership with God, and he's faithful to sustain this. So you expect that when you walk into the rest of the rooms, you're going to discover something about partnership. Let me take you into one of those rooms, chapters 8 through 11, verse 1, and let me read you some verses from there. So let's jump into, um, let's say, chapter 9, and I'm going to just share a few verses with you that you are probably very familiar with. Some of them I think you can recall from memory. Um, So 1 Corinthians 9, verse 9, for it is written in the law of Moses, do not muscle an ox while it is treading out grain. And you're like, what does that have to do with partnership? Remember, this message is written to the church in Corinth, a, a far, far, far distance away from Jerusalem, from Israel. So God is saying through Paul to the church in Corinth, this is what you need to do with missionaries. This is what you need to do with pastors. While they work, you need to feed them. You need to take care of them, just like that ox there. He needs to eat there. Why? You want the ox to go out, you know, make more little oxes, and then have enough energy to do what? To come back and to continue the work. Paul says the church needs to take care of the missionaries so that the missionaries can have enough energy to go out and do this incredible work year and far out so that they have enough energy to come back and be replenished. Verse 22, you remember this verse, to the weak I became weak to win the weak. In all things, uh, I, I became all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. Paul says, As a Jew in Israel, I became strong. I learned everything about God. Now I have enough energy to go out to the people of Corinth, who is weak, who doesn't know this yet. This strength will sustain me to pour into them until I'm weak too. And then I can go back and the process can continue. Chapter 9, verse 24, do you not know that all in a race uh, are, 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 are running that race, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. What does this have to do with partnership? Paul goes to the Corinth church and he says, you know what? I have learned about this race. God had shown us as the Jews that if you want to be in the winning team and only one team can win, you need to be in his team. I am here in Corinth to tell you now, you are actually in a race. You want to win this race, you need to be in the winning team. Let me tell you about this Team. All of them are examples about partnership. Chapter 10, verse 13, no temptation has ceased you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not tempt you beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Then in Corinth, they had a huge temptation to fall back into idolatry. Can you imagine when you are tempted, God will provide a way out? How must the Corinthians know how to fight temptation? Someone needs to come and tell them. So Paul says, here I am. In Israel, I have seen, experienced how my Lord Jesus was tempted. But he was able to fall off temptation. I know how that works. That's why in my partnership with God and the Jewish people, I had come all the way over here to Corinth to help you to understand how to fight temptation, how to run the race, how to become strong. How to make sure that the missionaries can continue to reach out to you. This ends in chapter 10, verse 31. So wherever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. In fact, I'm not seeking my own good, but the good of many so that many may be saved. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Paul says you need to remember this. In this world, it's not just about eating and drinking. It's about your partnership with God so that you can glorify him. And it's also about these other people that have no clue. Follow my example, Paul says, as I follow the example of Christ. And what was the example of Christ? In a partnership with God, he came to the Jews, to the chosen people group. There... Jesus literally launched them into the rest of the world. So 
Paul says, this is what I've learned from my Lord. In his partnership, he came right there where he was at. This would be our day spring today. To do what? To encourage them in such a way that they will be able to serve the world out there. And when that happens, Paul and Barnabas came back to Jerusalem, tells them what God is doing over there. And all the people in Jerusalem, Acts chapter 15 goes like, whoa, God is doing that? You see, global missions then fuel, encourages the local missions again. This is why this is a book that I would love to journey with you more. We're going to start not this Monday, but the following Monday. Thank you so much. So you can see why we brought Pastor Wayne on staff. All right. Incredible knowledge on the Word of God. And so I want to encourage you. We often talk about going deeper. We talked about that last week. This would be a great thing for you to do. And I was encouraged too because one of the verses that he, he got done with is, is something I was thinking about because it's a, it's a verse I committed to memory long ago and with things that come in our life. But that, that uh, Corinthians ten thirteen, no temptation has seized you, but what is common to man. It means we all go through the same thing. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But if you do fall into temptation, he will provide a way out that you and I may stand up under it. And I love that passage because so many times we get caught up in the pressures and the tensions and the things of life, and God is offering us a way out. I want to get into today's message as well, which really goes along with this sort of this partnership thing, and, and that's what we're doing as well. But Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38 is where we're going to be today. I don't know if, if you have ever felt this way, but you, have you ever felt like you needed to partner or you needed someone to partner with you? Like there were things that you were going through in life and you just needed someone to be there with you. You needed someone to step in in a moment of real need that you had and, and you needed them to walk beside you. When I was a... Um uh, when I was first starting out in youth ministry, and maybe even when I was studying it, uh, we decided to take a group of the teens paintballing, and it was over, I think, Christmas break, and, and I was home from college, and, and uh, I loved the idea of going paintball, and that was fairly new, and for those of you who don't know what paintball is, you just basically get a gun, you put these uh, pellets in it that are full of paint, and uh, they hit you, and uh, I was talking to some guys, and they're like, those things hurt. And uh, I am weak when it comes to things that hurt, you know? So I thought the cool thing is it is freezing outside. So I know what I'll do. I will bundle up with as many clothes as I can, you know? And I acted like it was because I needed to stay warm, but it was because I didn't want to feel the pain of a paintball, all right? So I put on these clothes and I honestly, I, I, I put on shorts, a couple pairs of shorts. I put on um, thermal underwear, which, yeah, is a great look, you know. And then I put on uh, several pairs of sweatpants. And then I put on uh, several T-shirts and several sweatshirts. And it was just layer after layer after layer. And I'm telling you, when I walked out, and I know I looked this way today, but it was, I was much thinner then. But it was like I was waddling out of this area. You know, I was packed. The only thing I wish I would have thought about was I forgot to put my socks on. And uh, that was a difficult situation, trying to bend through all of this stuff. And got my shoes on, got the gloves on, got the hat on. And I'm telling you, during the winter break, I decided that I was going to try to sport a beard at this time. I found out that I don't really grow a beard well. And the other thing is my beard comes in red. I don't know why that is, but it comes in red. And I was at that phase where, you know, it's going every which way and it itches like crazy. But I'm telling you, I got all this stuff on in the middle of the house. And man, was I sweating now. You know, so we got in the car. I think we had a Geo Metro at the time, maybe. You know, there was like a throwaway car. You could pick them up, man. It got like 60 miles a gallon, I think. But it was a scary death trap is what it was, honestly. Uh, we got in this car. Uh, we took some of the teens. We got about to, I think, the, uh, maybe the Mansfield sort of area. And when we got there, uh, my car broke down. And as a result, I told the teens who were in my car, I said, why don't you go with the rest of the group? I'll stay with my car. I, uh, again, I was in college, so I called my dad and I said, hey, I need someone to get me. The car is not working. I don't know what's going on, again, because I'm not a car guy. And so uh, he sent like a tow truck for me. But in the midst of all this, I was going to have to wait. And I tell you, like in the midst of waiting, I mean, it was getting super cold. So I got outside for some reason and I saw what I thought was the greatest sight I've ever seen. It was the golden arches of McDonald's. 
And I thought, I'm going to go into McDonald's, and I'm going to get, it was early morning, so I just wanted a bacon, egg, and cheese biscuit meal, you know, and I couldn't wait to order that. And I got up there to order that thing, and I was feeling pretty good about myself. Again, I was sweaty. They, at, they told me what I owed, and I think at that time, it was probably around $4. I think it'd be $17 today is what it would cost. But I went in to get my wallet, and this is when I realized it was about three layers down, I think, you know. So I'm getting my wallet out. I'm trying to count enough money. And uh, all of a sudden, I handed them proudly this money. I got my meal. And as I turned around, I don't know if you've ever had one of those moments, but it's that moment when everyone is just looking at you, all right? Matter of fact, I'm having one of those moments right now, okay? But I had one of those moments where I felt like the whole room was just staring at me. So as they were staring at me, I looked around, and then all of a sudden it hit me what I am wearing. And I don't even think I took a shower that morning, so I'm pretty sure I had a stench around me. And as I was ordering this meal, and, and as I was taking it back, and I saw people, this one lady literally grabbed her kid, and she said, shh, honey, don't stare, you know? And so I went in my little corner, and I sat there with my food, and uh, I was a, you know, I couldn't wait to be a youth pastor, but there was a group of punk teens over there, and I know they were making fun of me, you know, they were pointing and laughing and stuff, and I mean, I felt about this big. And I thought to myself, these people have no idea who I am. They have no idea my situation. They're just looking at me and already they have in their mind who I am, what I'm all about, how I've gotten myself into this situation, and where I felt like, honestly, it was one of those times I thought to myself, boy, our world could be in trouble when we don't show compassion to those that are really in need. I thought to myself, I wish somebody would have just sort of known the situation I was in. And I wanted to really scream like, I have money, I have things, my car's broke down. But I just wanted to take that moment in for a minute because it made me realize what other people in the world feel like when they're down and out, when they don't have things put together, when everyone stares and points or they try to turn a blind eye. And that's why I love when we look at the story of Jesus. Because Jesus, several times in his ministry, is coming around people that are in utter need. And he looks at them, and he sees their situations, and he has compassion on them. And then he begins to meet their needs. And listen, church, there are times when you and I have been in those moments where nobody else knows what's going on, where we've had those times where we just needed somebody to step in and just give a kind word or Or maybe we've needed somebody to step in and just to provide a little bit of help financially. Or we needed somebody to just take our kids for a day. Or we we just needed somebody to speak truth into our lives. And and for whatever reason, people turn to blind eye. And and maybe you felt that. But there's people all over our world that go through that. And so I want us to look again today at Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. It says this, Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for your word, and I want to thank you for experiences that we go through in life that help us to empathize with others that may be going through situations. And even though ours may seem funny at times or probably sort of trivial, there are those in our world that have real needs, real concerns, and they need somebody to step in. I pray today that as we would go through this message and as we heard Pastor Wayne share that we would understand that we are called individually to be in partnership with you to the needs of the world around us. So help us figure and help us have eyes that see and then a willingness to serve and a willingness to give. I pray that if there's anything that I would get wrong with in the text today, that you would clean it up in the ears of the people so that the voice they hear today is yours and not mine. In your name we pray. Amen.
So again, I want to look at verses 35 through 36. And again, it's a shorter passage. So it says that Jesus went through all the towns and villages and he, he was teaching in their synagogues. He was proclaiming this good news of the kingdom. And it says, and healing every disease and sickness. And when the crowds, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. And I want you to see sort of what was going on. I believe that Jesus saw three things in this passage. The first thing he saw is this. Jesus saw the need for those that are hurting. When he looked at these crowds, when he looked at the people around us, because I think too many times that we have blinders when it comes to people in need. Like if you're ever walking down like a major um, city and, and you see people holding the signs or you see people that are confused and, and they seem kind of down and out, instead of engaging them, we tend to walk way out. We tend to not want to stare. We don't want to focus because we don't want to have to deal with the real needs that are out there. You know, one of the things that I, I, uh, I, I can't stand to do, like my wife and I, we love to take cruises. One place I, I, I hate to take a cruise to is Jamaica. And the reason why I hate taking a cruise to Jamaica is because I've been on like five or six missionary trips there. And I've been with the people and I've seen the huts and I've seen the things that they live in and I've seen the lack of stuff that they, that, that, that's not present in their life. And when you take the cruise ship in there and you go into port, they do this great job of making everything look beautiful and everything look wonderful. And then they have this whole thing gated in because they don't want the locals to get in there. And then the moment you go outside of that gate, it's like another world. And I've been in that other world. So for me to go in there, it's like, it just seems like a blind eye. It seems like I'm having all this fun and enjoying this moment. And not that God doesn't want us to have those, but I, it, I have just seen too much. And it's like, it's easier to have the blinders on. It's easier not to see the real hurts of people. And you and I know that this is true because you and I know that sometimes we walk into a, a store and we'll see a certain person that we know that they have hurts and we know that they have needs and we know what's going on in their life, but we know if we stop and talk to them, they, it's going to take a ton of time. So what do we do? We go down another aisle. Or we try to find our way as quick out of that store as we can. Because we don't want to engage in that moment. It's going to take too much time. And I don't want to deal with the real hurts. And I don't want to deal with the real things out there. Jesus was looking at this crowd. He saw the filth. He saw the grime. He knew the contagious diseases that would probably be within some of those people. And when we look at the story and life of Jesus... Even those who had leprosy, even those people who were to yell, unclean, unclean, if you came within a certain distance of them, it says that Jesus went right up to them and he did what? He touched them and he healed them. And I love that word when we read that he just touched them because I honestly believe this. I honestly believe that a lot of healing comes just from touch. I believe that a lot of people just need to be recognized. There's a lot of people in this congregation that we will often turn a blind eye towards. I'll never forget when my, um, when my nephew Bryson, when he lost his leg, I remember that Bo and Nicole, every time they saw somebody else that lost their leg, they would go up and they would ask their story. And these people, one after another, would say, thank you for asking me, because most people just don't want to look. And they said, it's good to have somebody acknowledge and I think it's easier for us not to acknowledge. But a touch is significant. I mean, it takes us back to when we were kids. Like a kid falls down and, and they get, you know, a bruise or they get a cut. You know all they want? All they want is for their mom to touch that or to kiss it. And it's amazing because they'll be deeply crying and deeply hurt and they don't know how to deal with it. Then all of a sudden, their mom kisses it and it's like, oh, that was a miracle. And they're healed. You know, and all they needed was somebody to acknowledge their hurt and to touch them. And there's not much difference really between a kid and between us. Because there's a lot of people that are hurting in this world. And it's not just about the physical things. There are things that are happening emotionally to them where they are diseased, where they are infected, where they're going through some real relationship struggles or having problems at work or having problems dealing with people, other family situations, their kids. And you know, all they need is a touch from somebody. 
a call from somebody, somebody that will gauge them for a moment and say, I see that need. I just want to talk to you. I want to hear your story. And it's amazing. Just listening to somebody's story amazingly has this ability to heal people. You see, Jesus has given every one of us that ability to do that. But he saw the hurting and he responded by healing and by touching. And you and I can have the same effect on others as well. Secondly, what I saw was this. And by the way, when you heal and when you touch somebody that nobody else wants to touch, you know, in that moment, you've allowed them to feel valued. You've given them a moment where they felt worth something. Second thing he saw was this. He not only saw that those who are physically diseased or physically hurting, but he also saw the need for the lost as well. And you get this because in that last sort of verse 36, it says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. And he says, because they were harassed and helpless and they were like sheep without a shepherd. In other words, there was this group of people that they needed some sort of direction, but they were lost. And they were lost because they were just being harassed over and over and over again. And you have to imagine in this culture this time, what were they being harassed by? They may have been harassed by the Romans' authority, by those people who just wanted to tax them and all that. But it wasn't just that. Listen, they were being harassed by the church as well. Now, that might blow your mind for a minute. But the church were putting all these rules and all these expectations that the church was not a place that was seen full of grace. It was kind of seen of this is the rigid way you have to live your life when it comes to Christianity. This is how much you have to give. This is how much you have to serve. These are the amount of steps you have to take. And if you don't do these things in this precise order, then you are sinning and you are in danger of hell. And they would keep that and they would harass you. And these people, it was hard to follow. It was hard to understand. And Jesus was just trying to simplify and saying, it's all about grace. And what he wanted them to do is he didn't want them to be harassed and he didn't want them to feel helpless. He wanted them to know that there was a shepherd who could lead them. He wanted them to know that there was a person in their life where they could get direction from. And I have to tell you, church, we all stand in a world where there are people that are lost. There are people that are lost in their relationships. There are people that are lost in, I don't know even how to survive in life. I don't, I don't know how to pay my bills. I don't know how to do a lot of things. And they can just be walking around so aimlessly. They can be seeking the things of this world, thinking that will give them joy and satisfaction. And at the end of the day, they're lost because they don't have Jesus Christ. So many of us, if, if you're parents, you know that there are times that your kids are lost when they're walking around aimlessly and they don't have any real direction and you're trying to point them in the right direction and as a parent, that's your responsibility to let them know what the difference is between right and wrong. But at the end of the day, what a kid knows is that even if I make the wrong mistakes, I still have a parent out there who loves me, who cares about me and supportive. And the reason why they're trying to make sure I walk in the right direction is out of that love for me. And you and I need to understand that we have a Savior who desperately loves us, who wants to walk with us, who understands that there are times that we're lost, that this world is just so overwhelming at times. And that you have a Christ that wants to come in and say, here, here's when you need to go. Here's how you need to respond. Here's how you need to react. And if you and I would just walk in his presence, would understand who he is, like you and I could be in that very moment. And so Jesus responded with direction. He wanted to educate them. He didn't want them to be harassed. He wanted to say, like, this is what the law is about. Like, it's a governorship thing, but I also want you to know that you are loved and you are filled with grace. And even though you've made some major mistakes in your life, like, I still love you. And I'm still gonna be there for you. We get into verses 37 and 38. And then we see this. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And so what Jesus was saying is, guys, look, I I want you to get rid of the blinders. What do you see out there? You physically see the people that are hurting. You've seen the people who have been harassed by the Roman authorities, and you've seen the people that have been harassed by the church. Like, you see those things. You see that people are lost at times. But he says, I want you to take it a step deeper. 
Because he says, the other thing I want you to see is I want you to see this world that is primed and ready to have someone that will step up, someone that who will step in and someone that will lead, help, and understand. Jesus says, what I want you to see at the end of the day is there's this great big harvest of people wanting to feel valued, of people wanting to feel loved. But at the end of the day, what he said to his disciples that day is, but there are very few people who will work and get the job done. There are very few people who will step out of their comfort zones and step into somebody else's situation and help. There are very few people who will recognize the needs that are out there, quit what they're doing, and go and help someone else. He said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And when Jesus got them in the right mindset, in the right frame of mind, what he did is this. He sent them. Because the next passage was what happens. He says, I want you to pray that the Lord will send more workers. And I love this idea of praying because if you pray something, here's what you'll find out. Once you begin to pray for something, God may just call you to do the very thing that you've prayed about. And then if we get into the next chapter, what you'll notice is Jesus sends out the 12 to go do a work. And church, I want you and I to be a little cognizant right now of what's going on in our world. And I want you to break it down just for a moment. And I hate to be a little selfish in this moment, but I just want you to recognize what are the needs that we just have in this church? What are the needs we have in this church? Let me tell you about some of those needs. We have 120 kids that we deal with every week in this church. We have a youth group that has 80 to 100 kids. You know what they need? They need workers in those places. They need people that God will call out of our comfort zones right now and volunteer. We got the same people working week after week after week with no break. You know what we're finding in this church? We have this big harvest that God has given us, but we have very few workers. And we need some people to step up and work. We also have found that in this church that people want to be a part of a small group because they want to connect with one another. But we have very few people that will step up and be leaders. We have very few people that will open up their homes. And I'm not really, I'm I'm really, I hope you understand, I'm not really trying to play this big guilt trip on us. I'm just trying to get us to see like there are needs out there. We need people to step up into leadership. We need people to step up out of their comfort zones and to help people. There's a ton of stuff, by the way, that the church could be doing if you and I would see the needs and we would give. Well, we even found out, listen, we, 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 have a big, um, uh, we have a big budget we work with. But there is so much more we could do, honestly, if more people just gave. And I often thought, I tell you, as a kid, I was talking with Pastor Wayne about this, because I've been reading the Bible over and over, and I've been trying to figure out how to talk about giving. And, and I'm sorry if this is your first week here, because and this is the truth. I haven't talked about giving in, in, in the five years I've been the lead pastor. And so there's no pressure. And so if you're new, just tune me out right now. Okay, it's, it's, it's no big deal. But man, when I was a kid, I'm so glad that my parents taught me at an early age to just give 10%. And you know why that was important for me? Is because when I got my first paycheck, the first thing that came out of my check was my money to God. Now listen, here's the thing I realized though. The New Testament actually doesn't talk about tithe. It actually doesn't talk about 10%. It actually, like, there's a reference that Jesus makes to some of the religious people. He says, I know that you try to follow the 10% and these other things. He says, but I would rather you show grace than do those things. He says, but he still believes it's important. But here's what I want you to know. And even as I was talking with Pastor Wayne, we were, we were thinking about it from two different perspectives. I'm not so sure it's about the 10%. What Pastor Wayne would tell you, he would say, you know, I think what the scripture calls us to do and the way he likes to talk it is about, I want you to give sacrificially. In other words, I want you to give in a way that it might hurt a little bit. Because you remember the the widow who had nothing? She gave a very little, but guess what? It hurt to give it. And she was blessed because of it. Other passages of scripture say this. Other passages of scripture say that I want you to give cheerfully. And it says, if you don't give cheerfully, then it doesn't really matter anyways. You know, and for some of you, you're like, well, how can I give cheerfully? And I have to tell you, every year, like, it's funny because the church sends out a statement and they they tell me how much I give. And there's part of me that goes, 
man, I could have bought this with that. But then there's another part that is like, I can't believe that I gave that and was still able to survive. Lord, thank you for blessing me. You know, and matter of fact, when it says to be cheerful, like that word actually means to laugh out loud. So the next time you come in, we won't think weird of you. If you give your tithes and your offering, you just start laughing, okay? I mean, you'll get some strange looks, trust me. But what if we could come to a place where we could just give cheerfully? And the honest truth is this, some of you can only give cheerful at one or 2%. And some of you can only give sacrificially at that one or 2%. But the truth is others of you can give more than 10% and you could do it cheerfully. You know, that's not for me, that's for you and God to decide. But it takes finances to run the church. Like we wanna give to missions, Our goal, hopefully today, is to get $50,000 that maybe people over like the year will say, I'll give this much money a month or I'll give this much in just a one-time thing or I'll give this much in a year and and maybe if God provides more, then I'll give more. Listen, we have missionaries that we're trying to take care of. And I want you to know as a church some of the mission things that we're stepping into. First of all, we help with Voice of Hope. We help, and this is some of the local stuff we do. Uh, We help with, uh, there's a book program in town. It's the Dolly Parton foundation thing this church right here gives five thousand dollars every year so that kids can from the time they're in in, uh from the time their birth to kindergarten they get a book every month and this church helps in financing that we help with the gideons making sure that bibles are presented there's a ministry in town used to be called love inc it's called it's aspire ministries and we give money to them so that they can help meet the needs of some of the people out there in the community we take care of downtown when the big christmas tree and all the lights are downtown in that park This church is doing that. This church does a Thanksgiving meal every year. For almost 2,000 meals we serve. Like that happens because you're giving. There is a backpack ministry program that we do here at the church that Kathy Mask has been doing and she's been blessed financially. But they do, I think, almost 160 book packs every Friday that they send home with kids to make sure that they have food for the weekend. That happens, why? Because of your giving. Some of the missions organizations that we're working with, we're working with One Plus God, because he has 60 missionaries that they're doing. We want to make sure that they're provided for. Brian Augenstein, who's connected to the church, he's got this ministry that goes overseas and helps with a lot of worship type things, and we're helping him. I want you to listen to Chris and Amy Rice. I was with them in youth group. They grow up in this church. They're in a ministry called Wycliffe Bible Translators. They're literally translating the Bible so people can have Bible in their own language. And we've been supporting them for years and will continue to support them. We've taken on Ryan and Sarah Schmitz who are in Nicaragua. And if you've seen and heard some of the stories they're doing, like we are impacting them. Now let me give you something else. We have two more people in this church, actually three, that have been called to full-time missions work. Church, we gotta help them. I would love to be able to support them to the place where they don't have to go anywhere else and ask for money. One is Aubrey Powell. She is a a single lady in the church. She's gonna be going to Afghanistan at some point because of the needs that are out there. And then we just got confirmation from Andrew and Marley Foltz who are in the church. And they just got signed up with World Gospel Missions and they're hopefully gonna go to Japan in the near future. And so those are sort of the global things. But I believe this, as you and I continue to be faithful in our giving, We're gonna be faithful in our sending and God's gonna keep rising more and more leaders up. Those are the things that are going on in the church. Now, let's make this practical for a moment. Of course, I would love if you gave to the church and allowed us to do the work that we're gonna do. But you know what I think is more important? I think it's more important that you see the needs that are around your workplaces and around your community. And I think you need to figure out how to give in those moments. I think you need to find the hurting that are around you in your homes. I, need to th- I think you need to see the, the, the needs of the people that you work with. And I think you need to give of your time and energy. I'm gonna tell you this, I probably didn't say this clearly enough, but I believe there's three kinds of giving. I believe there's time, talent, and treasure. And I found this true in the church. If more people gave of their time and talents, we would need less treasure to do what we need to do. But listen, what if you and I would take the blinders off? What if you and I were sitting at a restaurant 
and we saw a family. What if we saw a single mom with her three kids and it's a real treat for them to go out that day and it's probably costing her something to invest in that moment. What if you and I saw that need and we picked up that person's check that day? You know what that would do for that individual? That would be an overwhelming sign of love for them. And you know what it allowed them to do? It would allow them to do another meal out with their family and give that moment or do something else with that money. Like those are taking off the blinders and saying, these are the needs in front of me. What would it be like if you saw that coworker that just seemed a little bit down, that the tears were welling up in their eyes and you knew that something was off? What would it mean for you to go up to that person and say, hey, seems like you're a little down today. Are you okay? Is there anything I can do for you? And what if we just sat with them for a moment and let them share what was going on? And what if we just showed them some value and some interest? You see, there's a lot of people who just need to share, but there's no one that will engage them in listening. You see, people, if we want to be disciples of Jesus Christ, if we want to be in partnership with him, then as he allows us to see the needs out there, then you and I will respond to those needs. And we're going to make this world a better place. And we're going to take this harvest that is plentiful <laughs> And man, are we going to reap some things. Because the churches are going to grow around here from people really stepping out and stepping up. Can you stand with me this morning, church? Just a word. You, you do have those cards with you today. If, if, if you do want to fill it out, and if the most you can do is pray, pray. But if you're able to fill it out today and drop it off in the offering box on your way out, that's fine. If not, if you need to take it home, pray about it, go ahead and do that. And if you, if you can't do anything, don't worry about it, all right? Because this is between you and God. And here's what I know. And this is what Wayne was saying. Whatever we give, even if it's little, if we give it with sincerity, we're in partnership with God. And he's gonna multiply that thing like he did, the loaves and the fish anyways. Let's pray together. Father God, we just want to thank you for this moment today. And um, these things aren't always easy to talk about in a church because we know that um, most people feel like churches, that's all they talk about is money. And I don't want to just sit on the money. I want to just sit on the way that you're telling us to reach out to those that are in need around us. There are a lot of hurting people, a lot of lost people, a lot of people that just need a simple touch, a simple um, listening to, a simple word that is spoken. Father, I pray today that we would be engaged and in partnership with your ministry. And as you take off the blinders and as we see the needs around us, I pray that we as individuals step into those needs. Because I think that you, and I know that you've called the church to do a great work, but I also know that you've called individuals to just step out when no one else sees or when no one else is looking. Matter of fact, in your word, it tells us, I'm more concerned about what you do in private than what you do publicly. So may we find those ways in privacy to reach out to people and to touch their lives and then watch as you bless that work that we do. Father, you've been so gracious to us. You've been so loving. Help us to leave this place and change people. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, church, thanks for meeting. Let's find ways to give uh, to those around us. We love you. We'll see you next week. Thanks again for listening. If you are located in the Marion area, we would love to have you join us at one of our Sunday morning gatherings. For directions, service times, and information about our fantastic children and student ministries, please visit us at dayspringwesleyan.org. That's dayspringwesleyan.org.